All right, so we're in the middle of a series here. It's called When Pigs Fly. And you guys, if you've been here last couple Sundays, we started out with the miracle. We, we categorized the miracles that are recorded in Scripture. We put them under four categories. They're under deliverance. They're under protection. They're under provision. Or they're under the category of healing. Last Sunday, Becky, I was honored to have Becky, my wife, on stage to talk about. And Karma, thank you so much, Karma, for helping us out to be on stage and talk about the miracle of her healing. If you weren't here, if you're new here, my wife had a postpartum cardiomyopathy in 2013. Her heart stopped for 35 minutes. She was on stage and I was talking about the miracle that God performed in her life and she's completely healed. And so we praise God for that. We tell that story with a lot of respect to God and a lot of honor to God. It's nothing that Jimmy or Becky did. It's what God did. And then the first Sunday, we talked about the miracle of deliverance and how we speak in authority through Jesus' name. Not that we have more power, but that we have the authority. Remember that? Like the, I used the analogy of the police officer stopping the traffic with his authority, not the power. That semi-truck could make a splat out of him in the road. But he has the authority to stop it. And you do too. And how we pray over our families and how we plead the blood of Jesus around our families, the miracle of deliverance. But today we're going to talk about provision. And so how many of you got a number in your hand when you walked in here this morning? Yeah, all right. So you got your numbers. Make sure you get your number out. And we decided, I mean, the first Sunday we had this little pig race, which was kind of cool. We've had too much fun with this pig series. Uh, we, we did a little pig race, which was an in, inflatable little pigs. And we batted them to the back. It was a nice little race. Last week, I threw bacon out. I didn't really throw it. I handed it out. This week, I have a ham. I'm not going to throw it. I'm going to ask Brady to come up here and go put it in the fridge after, as soon as we're done. But for right now, I need you to pick that number, put it in your hand, and we have a ton of numbers. Now, we did more numbers. I have matching numbers to every number that's out there. So we're going to pick a number until we get it. You want to come up here and get one, Andrew? I'm going to let you pick one out. Come on, Andrew. Pick one out. They're banking on you. Like people, Mike, you mind getting one? All right. You got your numbers, Mike? It's not the right one. Oh, <laughs> 27. Anybody have 27? All the way in the back, Mr. Paul Miller. Congratulations. Oh, who has it? Who? I can't see. Sarah has it. All right, congratulations, Sarah. Give her a hand. I felt, I'm going to take that. Would you take this back to the refrigerator that's back here in the coffee? Yeah, you, Brady. Yeah, make yourself useful, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're not here for your looks, buddy. <laughs> so we wanted to provide for someone, and congratulations, Sarah. Hope you enjoy that. Uh, don't, uh, yeah, our number is... What's Becky's number? You got Becky's number. We'll come over and help you with that if you want. So, Today is the miracle of provision. We're going to talk about the different miracles of provision. If we study scripture, a lot of the scriptural miracles that you see, they had provision in them. And when we think of provision in our day and age, we think, first of all, of money, how money gets tight. When you think of a miracle of provision, oh yeah, I was down to my last dollar and so-and-so gave me, or, or I, I found this, or this happened. And we think more in terms of money or financial. But I'm here to tell you that provision comes through peace, through joy, through marriage, uh, saving marriage. There's a lot of different aspects that provision can be found. And if you, in, in every state and story of need in scripture, there was a miracle of provision. If you think about when Jesus fed the 5,000 with the feeding of the thousands on the hill, you know that there was a need, there was provision. The very first miracle that was spoken of in scripture is when Jesus went to the wedding and they needed wine. And he turned the water into wine. Now, we as Mennonites, you know how we feel about that, but that's okay. He did it, right? Elisha and the widow, when he went to her house and they started to pour the wine, it kept coming and coming. There was a need there. And so where there was a need, there would be a miracle of provision. And uh, bread from heaven would drop down. There was a Nichols bakery up there. 
And the children of Israel would have their bread every morning. There was a miracle of provision. Jonah was about to drown. A giant fish or whale came and gave him provision of protection and rescue. So many different examples throughout Scripture of provision, the miracle of provision. In every story of need, there was a miracle of provision. And it came in all sorts of different ways. I heard this story many times through my life, and you probably heard it too, but there was a, a single lady who was living in an apartment complex, and she did not have life very well. She had a rough time of it, and every day she would sit on her back porch and she would pray out loud and she would say, Lord Jesus, would you please supply for me today? Would you provide for me today? And then she'd go through the list of the things that she needed provided for. Well, her neighbor was an atheist who lived just next door down, and every morning he would go out to have his coffee. He would hear this lady praying to God that God would provide for her, and he got so sick and tired of it. So he decided he's going to prove to her that there is no God, and the one morning he was out there, she, he heard her say that she needs food for her family, for her kids. So he went down to the grocery store. He said, I'll trick her. Went down to the grocery store and bought three bags of groceries, came back up, put them right in front of her door, and hid in the bushes until she came back. Well, she came back and she goes, oh, thank you, Jesus, for providing. And she praised God right there. He jumps up behind the bush and says, ha ha, I got you. See, there wasn't God. It was me. And she said, oh, that's even better. Thank you, Lord. You made the devil pay for it. <laughs> I'll quit with my jokes one of these days, I promise you. Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. Can we get Philippians 4.19 up there? And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. You know what? Did I forget to give it to you? James Mast here. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to tell you right now, 1 Kings chapter 17. The pastor has forgotten to give the, uh, the I'm not going to go do it now. So uh, we have no overhead this morning. 1 Kings chapter 17, turn to it. We're going to read that scripture from 7 to verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 17, 7 through 16. This is where we're going to hang out most of the morning. The rest of it, I will tell you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says this, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That's simply telling us that it doesn't matter who gives it. It doesn't matter how it comes. God is the provider of it, and he wants to give us good things. How many believe he is a giver of good things? Amen. He provides abundantly. It's important, though, to note he doesn't just meet our wants. He meets our needs. That's what he promises us. He doesn't promise us the wants. There's a difference between what we need and what we want. What I need is clothes. What you don't need is a Louis Vuitton bag. Is there such a thing? Yeah, I thought so. Or Air Jordan shoes. Or Matthew's bow. I'm kidding. We do need those. What I need is rest. What I don't need, what I want, though, is an all-inclusive vacation to a resort on a beach. But what I need is rest. You get the difference. There's a difference between the want and the need. What I need is shelter. Not a house with granite tops, countertops, and three-car garage, right? Those are wants. So as we study this story in 1 Kings chapter 17, there's three principles of the provision of miracle, of the miracle of provision that I want to point out to you. It's a very interesting story. I love this story. There's so much going on in here, and I want you to read it with me. So whatever you have this morning, your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones, I'll probably be fired after this. Not doing my job. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 through 16. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. Because there, I think I'm in the New King James Version, by the way. New King James Version. That the word, there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, 
Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Now he's talking about Elijah. And what you need to know about the backstory of this is Elijah was a prophet of God who was hated by King Ahab and Jezebel, his wife Jezebel. They were evil leaders of the land at that time, and they sought to kill Elijah. They had a bounty out for his life because he was, he, was, he was messing them up in their leadership. He had words of the Lord that interfered with the way that they wanted to lead. And so he took off and fled for his life. And he fled to Zarephath, or actually he fled to the mountains. And there's where God provided a brook. He started a brook for Elijah to provide for him. And the ravens would come and they would feed him every day. So we're going to pick this story up right about the time that the brook starts to dry up. You guys following me? All right, good. So, which belongs to Sidon. See, I have commanded a widow there to what? To provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in the jar. Now, I want you to see what he's doing there. I just did it last night to Beck. I said, Hey, Beck, while you're up, you guys ever do that? Uh, you're going to the fridge while you're up. I'm the only guy that does that. That's what Elijah was doing to this lady. Hey, while you're going, get me a piece of bread too. You're getting me with some water. I need some bread. She's telling him, I don't have bread. I only have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil left. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son. That way that we may eat it and what? Die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterwards make some for yourself and your son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by and through Elijah. The number one principle, I've got three of them, and I'm going to go through them fairly fast. But the number one principle that I want you to know when it comes to miracles of provision is when God and where God guides, he always provides. When he guides you and where he guides you, he always provides. Elijah had it made, did he not? He was being basically on welfare from God. He was sitting in the mountains I'm sure it was beautiful there. It's probably. I was over there, Dan. You remember that? It wasn't that nice. But anyway, he was having it. (laughs) I'm kidding. It was beautiful in its sense. It's just not as lush green as what I like to see it around here. But there he is in the mountains. God is providing for him. There's a brook that's flowing down. And if you're over there, you'll know that water is a huge, huge commodity over there in Israel. It doesn't rain very often, maybe once, twice a year that it rains really, really hard, and that's the water they have. And so God is providing for him. The ravens are dropping bread down for him. He doesn't have to work hard. There's, there's, he's got life pretty much made. He's protected in the cove of that mountain. God was providing for him protection. He was providing food. He was providing water. He was providing him rest. Everything. And one day, God comes down and says, the word of the Lord came to him and says, go. I need you to get up and I need you to go. So he gets up from his posh lifestyle, so to speak, and walks down into the village where he's being obedient. He's looking for this widow that God had told him would be down there. And sure enough, she's 
right there outside of the city gates gathering sticks for what could possibly be her very last meal on earth she's preparing for. She's preparing for it that way. What's interesting to me is Elijah is guided from his need into another person who has similar needs to his. And God guided him there. He led him there and said, this is what I want you to do. And the obedience factor is the key part. I've said it over and over and over. You guys have heard me say this. The anointing flows in your life after the obedience factor has taken place. You'll never see the anointing flow in Scripture in any of the stories until people make the move and the step. But where he leads you, he will provide. I remember as a kid going to church, I went, I feel like I went to church every single day. When we had revival meetings, we would have church Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. You guessed it, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. That was what a revival meeting was. And I remember uh, as a kid, I mean, I, I, I grew up, my dad was the pastor of a church, and so I was mandated to go. And the highlight of it was is when we would have those revival meetings, and I know that any night but Sunday night, because we're not going to spend money at a store on Sundays, right? And we, I, that's how I was raised. But I would get, there were nights that we would either be invited to someone's house, but the ones that I was really excited about is when we would go out and get a snack somewhere at a restaurant or ice cream, or he would take us to eat. He would lead us there. We would go there. And there was never once that I sat there and thought, I wonder how much money is in my dad's bank account. I wonder if he has enough to pay for mine. As kids, you don't do that. You rely on your father. And where he took me, I was certain that he would have enough to provide for me. Unless it's Dairy Queen, Kurt. I owe him Dairy Queen. Instead, he's getting a peanut buster parfait instead of preaching today. Instead, or I'm preaching today, I guess. I trusted my dad to have what it took. If he took me there, he provided for me. And it's the same way in our spiritual life. When God leads us somewhere or in our lives, know that he will provide for you. He will. It's a promise that he has. He's not going to take you somewhere and not provide for you. Then when I turned about 15, 16, I started not going along. I found out, hey, this does cost money. And uh, so as many times as I could, I would sneak along. And I see a similar pattern in my family. <laughs> but when we do make those moves and there's things going on in our lives, sometimes we think, man, I wonder if God actually has enough for me. I've been in that situation. I wonder, man, is God actually going to come through for me and Becky? Is he going to or is his, am I at the end of faith? Am I at the end of his faithfulness? We all believe that God is faithful, don't we? But we tend to forget as life goes on and we're looking and we're saying, okay, God, what about me? You're doing it for everybody else. What about me? God always provides. And I have the same verse that uh, Miss Lexi was talking about this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 24, it says, look at the ravens. They don't eat or they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for God feeds them. And you are way or you are far more valuable to him than any of the birds. God has your best interests and my best interests in mind. We have to keep that in our minds and in our hearts. We have to believe that. My thoughts go to Abraham and Sarah. You know the story there. They couldn't have children. They were mighty old in their age, but God had promised them a child, and, and you know they waited and waited and waited. Finally, one day, here comes that promised son. And then God turns around and tests Abraham and says, I need you to sacrifice your one and only son, the one that I promised for you. I need you to sacrifice that. And how do you think that was? Put yourself in that shoe and taking your son and walking up that mountain. He's carrying the firewood and he knows the ritual. He knows the whole event of how this is supposed to play out. And he looks over and says, Dad, where is 
the sacrifice. And what does Abraham say in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8? Faith comes alive in Abraham. He knows that when God leads you somewhere, that you will, he will provide for you. Abraham knew that because he's answered this way. God, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. So as Abraham lays Isaac on that altar, it wasn't just good enough to say that. He already, he had told Isaac that it's going to happen. But he lays him on the altar anyway, and he raises his hand ready to sacrifice him. And an angel appears and said, do not lay a hand on your boy. I know you fear God. And then in verse 13, he says this way, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. What would have happened if Abraham would have said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do it. I know that you're calling me to that, but I'm not going to do that. How do you think it would have played out? The story would have been mighty different. But his obedience played right into the whole lineage of Jesus, our Savior. If we pursue his will, his provision will follow. When he guides, when God guides us, he always provides. The number two principle that I want to leave with you this morning is God miraculously multiplies what is given. What is given. All throughout, they did first. They gave first. When? When, the, when, when was the widow's oil? When was it expanded or uh, made more? How, how did he do that? After she started pouring, the obedience came. The loaves and the fishes of the little kid, when were they multiplied? When it was broken, it was given, it was broken and gave thanks for. When he gave it up. When was it? Abraham became the father of nations. When? After he offered to sacrifice his first son. So God multiplies what is given. Becky and I can tell you over and over in our lives, we have experiences and we have testimony of you can take. And I had to think this morning, I almost got up and did the offering for Lexi because it's like, you have that money in your hand, and if you and then maybe one of these Sundays I'll get you to do it. Just hold it up, and you say, "God, this is yours." But God can't do anything with it until you drop it or give it to Him. He can't multiply it until it's given. And I know Becky and I, we had issues like things happen in our lives, and we're like, "Okay, God, this is yours." And it's one thing to hold it up and say it's yours. It's another thing to let it go. That's a whole different level of obedience is when you say, okay, God, take it. He cannot take it till you open your hand. He can't. You will pull tug of war the whole time. You've got to give and God can then multiply what is given. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it. What you keep is all you have ever in your life. What you keep is what you have, but what you give God can multiply. There's so much that each and every one of us can give. Not just money. I'm not talking money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about hope. I'm talking about prayer for others. I'm talking about just a listening ear. I'm talking about a smile. <laughs> we need smiles in our lives right now. They're all covered up with masks. I can't stand it. There's something that a smile does for you in a day's time. And when you don't see it, and I, I've told you guys before, like it seems like people that come to our place of business with masks on right now, it just seems like they're, that's an excuse to be snobby. I don't know how y'all do it, but I kind of feel the same way. You make me wear a mask, I don't need to be nice. You don't know who I am anyway. But God miraculously multiplies what is given, even if it's just a smile. 
as we look at the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17, as I study that, I, I'm thinking to myself that, you know, there, there are a couple different entry levels, so to speak, of problems. There, there, there's a couple different levels of problems. The, the first one is an entry level, and, and, and then you go to a graduate level. Let me explain it this way. <laughs> I'm a picky eater. If I go to a restaurant and I order a side salad with ranch on the side, I expect it to be on the side. I don't want it on my dressing. It gets soggy from the kitchen to my table. So I order it on the side. If, if they don't put it on the side, that is an entry level problem. Okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about. A graduate level problem. A more intense problem would be if I'm up against and I don't have money to make my payments and I don't know how my kids are going to eat. That's a graduate level problem. Another one, entry level would be gas prices are too high. Graduate level problem would be, you know what? The engine in my car blew. I still owe $10,000 on it and my warranty just ran out. Now your warranty shouldn't run out because you're getting those phone calls the same way I am. Every day. Entry level would be the sniffles. Graduate level would be cancer that's incurable. You get what I'm saying. There's different levels of problems that you and I face in our lives. This lady, 1 Kings chapter 17, would you want to agree with me? This was a graduate level problem. She was at the end of her rope. Can you imagine what was going through her mind as she walked out of the house that morning with a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil left in the pot? And in her mind, she knows that her kids are malnourished. They're hungry. She has no way to provide. There hasn't been rain for how many years? When is this going to change? And so I don't know that it ever will. God, you know what? You provide for everybody else, but you're not providing for me. You imagine the thoughts that's going through her mind as she walks out. And she says, oh, I'm going to go gather some sticks. I'm going to bake one last little morsel of cake. And then I'm going to watch my family die of starvation. That is a graduate level problem. Would you agree with me? This is an entry level. If she were here today, what would she tell you? How would you, what would your response be to her? What I'll tell you is God knows exactly where you are and God knows exactly what you need. And what, what I find interesting is Long before she walked out of the house that morning to go gather the sticks for the potential last meal that they'll ever have together, God had already put in motion possibly months before to start drying that brook up so that Elijah gets off of his rear and goes down there to provide for her. This is Look at it from that view. And we worry about an election? Just ask him. I said I wouldn't do that. Lord, help me. God had sent provision for her long before she ever needed it or asked for it. It was in motion up on the mountain, God's provision for her. He knew exactly where she would be, and he knew exactly what she needed, the miracle of provision. Her miracle came when Elijah's problem started. His brook dried up. What's interesting to me, too, and we say, is, is God used a hungry man to minister to a hungry woman. And we say, my life ain't good enough, Jimmy. You know what? I can't invite anybody to church. I'm struggling with sin. I'm struggling with that. I sh you know what? Out of that is where you can start your ministry. I promise you, Becky and I are living examples of that. We're not perfect either. And if you think we are, hang out with us once. 
You don't have to be perfect to start providing. Some of you are nodding your head. I get it. You don't have to wait until everything is perfect in your life. Guess what? If you do that, you will sit by a dried up brook the rest of your life. And people won't want to be around you because you're not happy. You're not being the provision that God is asking you to be for someone else. And we're all in it together. We're all here to help each other. The miracle of provision is the fact that he knows exactly where you're going to be and exactly what you're going to need. And he knows exactly who's going to take care of it. It's all of us together. Out of our needs, we minister to others who are in the same need. A hungry man provided a miracle of provision to a hungry woman in 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to ask the team to come up, Lexi and the team, if you guys would come. God could use you in the middle of a dysfunction to meet someone else's need. said, well, we can't have people over. We don't have granite countertops. Or our yard ain't mowed. I've done that. I'm picky like that. I'm using examples of myself. We make all these excuses. Or we can't have people over because the house ain't clean. Or I'm not a good cook. God's banking on us to help each other to, for the provision of other people so they have miracles in their life. So many times we focus so much on our issues that we forget to see the needs of others around us. And had Elijah done that, the story would read differently here in 1 Kings chapter 17. There had been a different outcome for the widow. She was up against the ropes. And that outcome would have been different. Stop waiting on what you want and start working with what you have. It will provide a miracle of provision for someone. This woman said, this is all I have. And Elijah said, that's, that's enough. It's going to be enough. God does this over and over and over again. He does a lot with just a little. And the one thing that I've learned, if you guys would stand, the one thing that I've learned in my life just when I think I've reached the end of faithfulness, I realize that I've only started scratching the surface. God is faithful. How many believe that this morning? He is faithful. The other thing that I've noticed is at the end of Jimmy, me, at the end of Jimmy is where the miracles start. God can't do a miracle when I'm in the way because I'm in the way and I think I can do it myself. At the end of Jimmy, is where the miracle started, the end of ourselves. We're always needing God's provision in our lives, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's at our work, whether it's our kids, whether it's joy, whether it's peace. We always need provision, don't we? We're never so low that we can't think of a reason to praise God. I mean, we should never be so high that we don't need him. Amen. It's always something to be thankful for, even through all of the mayhem that's going on. What are you thankful for? Thankful that you're healthy this morning because there's other people that aren't. Are you thankful that you got to come here this morning because there's other people that couldn't? Are you thankful? What are you thankful for? Are you thankful for your kids? Thankful for your husband? No? Philippians 4, 19 says this, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Remember this, guys. The 
miracle of provision was done by other people most of the time. When God guides you, he always provides for you. God miraculously multiplies what is given. Release it. Give it. Bless it. Give it. And the last thing is you, you might be a part of God's miracle of provision.